Wasn't that an incredible trailer? <laughs> Woo! Uh, this film was an emotional roller coaster for me. I laughed, I cried, I was angry at times. It's, it's palpable, and it's a film that really sticks with you and resonates with you long after you watch it. I'm gonna start with you, Coleman. I think this is a question that's very important that everybody in this room needs to know about, and that is, who are you wearing on Sunday night at the Oscars? Okay, wait a minute, that has nothing to do with this. <laughs> I, I will be wearing something a bit more subdued, <laughs> but, um, but I'm very glad to be here representing, um, I flew in just this morning because this was very important for me to be here for our U.S. kickoff of this film uh, before I head to this beautiful Oscar weekend. Um, and you know, and thank you, but I, and it's funny because people have been asking, like, oh my God, you're actually, you're gonna stop in Austin for less than 24 hours? Yes, because this film matters to me. Um, we get back to work. The accolades are great and wonderful. We're gonna have a wonderful time. But it's so wonderful to be able to use all that to amplify a film like this and my brothers here on, on this stage and brothers and sisters that are out there. So it's a beautiful time. I'm really happy that I have this moment because now I can give even more voice to a film like this that has so much meaning and impact. Great job not answering the question. Thank you for that. <laughs> Louis Vuitton for anyone who wants to Woo! Okay. <laughs> you, you don't miss on those red carpets. You don't miss. Okay, I'm gonna stick to the script. All right. Um, no, no, seriously, for, for, for Sing Sing, uh, Coleman, really, for this question for you, how would you explain the story of Sing Sing? And can you share specifically what the RTA program, RTA meaning Rehabilitation Through the Arts, what that program is? Sure, I'm gonna actually let my brother here talk about the program because he knows it even more so than I do. So I will, but I will just say what the film means to me. Uh, the moment that um, Greg Quedar and Clint Bentley um, proposed the idea of this film. They, they sent me a few things, like a, uh, an article from Esquire magazine that was done on Sing Sing on, on this program, and also they sent me um, just some beats of what was the possibility of a script. They'd been working on versions of the script for like, I think, seven years, and finally they were like, we have this idea and we would like to involve you and, and get your voice involved in this and really sort of tailor make it to for you know what you what you think is important as well. So we worked on it together and then met with this guy as well. We got on Zooms and we started to craft this film in a very organic way that's um, kind of unusual actually. But uh, we knew that not only the program, listen, I come from the theater and so did my, my buddy Sean over here. I think we all have theater roots. And I know the power of what theater can do for me. I can truly say, and this is not just a statement, but that theater saved my life in many ways, and I know, you know, it's true, yeah, you can yeah, applaud applause that. for that. And so I know what it did for me, who's out here as a professional actor, and I knew the power and impact that, could, that it has and it's been having on um, folks that are in the, the system. Um, my friend Clarence? Oh uh, yeah, RTA, Rehabilitation of the Arts, is a program created by Catherine Wilkins along with some other prisoners, some prisoners from Sing Sing, and um, what it's about, it's a, it's a program that teaches theater to individuals incarcerated, and it teaches a lot more. Along the way, it teaches humanity, it teaches empathy, it teaches a lot of things. A lot of things that you may think that you would pick up growing up, but coming from the neighborhoods that we come from, we, we, we miss out on some of these things, some of these emotions we never get to touch, some of these situations that we never get to be in, and some love that we don't never get to express. So we get to learn how to do that through RTA. This program actually saved my life, this program. And it saved a lot of men's lives that I know personally that this program really works. That's what rehabilitation art is. Yeah. Beautiful, absolutely. Uh, Sean, you're uniquely qualified to work on this movie because you have experience actually writing and putting together theater workshops um, in Bay Area prisons and county jails. Can you share about your time spent doing that and how did you incorporate that into this role? Yeah, uh, first of all, what's up, Austin? <laughs> <laughs> this is great to be here, uh, great to uh, speak on this movie. And yeah, I mean, like Coleman had said, we're, we're all theater folks, but there's theater folks and then there's theater folks that are out there trying to reflect the, the world we live in. And I think there's ways of empowering 
uh, rightfully centering folks. And I think one of the ways you can do that is to give the mic to the people that don't get the mic. And I'm lucky, I'm from the Bay Area, I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> Not two people in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> the fuck? Um, but in San Francisco, you know, the, the, in the air and the atmosphere is a sort of mixture of the personal and the political. And so I just get to soak in a lot. I, I'm really not uh, the one doing the work. There are great people in the Bay Area, like the great Rodessa Jones, who has an amazing program called the Medea Project, where she creates, yeah, and if anyone knows Rodessa Jones' work, that's working in, in the prisons, in the jails, all around the world with women inmates like that. And working with great writers like Dennis Johnson or Jimmy Santiago Baca, folks that have both done time but been inside working on that. And so you just try and form that. You know, what theater, what we can do is try and form a bridge that, that makes the space a little bit smaller from up here and out there. Right. So that the space between the two is as small as we can make it. And, you know, going into places that don't have theater uh, is one way to do it. So I, I really got it from that. And, you know, California is so fucked up. If you ever take a ride down uh, the 99, which is one of our main thoroughfares, you're going to see more prisons than you see schools or churches. Yeah. Let me repeat that. You're going to see more prisons than you see schools in California. So this is, this is the state of insanity that we live in, in the state of insanity. And so, you know, if you can get a microphone like this and speak on it, that's what we try and do in the theater, and in this case, in this great film. Uh, Paul, first of all, I love the pink socks. <laughs> There's a whole look going on. Black, the black <laughs> fingernail polish, I love it. Um, you've said, and, and I quote, I, I've worked with a lot of actors, but never had the kind of real connections I've had with these guys. Tell us about the connections and what they meant to you while working on this film. Well, uh, I'm sorry. Every, uh, I'm also a theater rat myself. That's how I... And theater saved my life. I, I ran into one professor at the university and uh, changed my life. Uh, coming into this situation, every time you do a theatrical production on stage, or on film, it, it is kind of a family. And then the family breaks up and you move on. But this was really special. Uh, getting to know Brent Buell, the guy that I play in the movie, he was the actual Brent Buell was uh, on set every day and I got to know him. And I could just see and feel the respect that these men gave to him and that he gave to them. Uh, it was just a beautiful thing. Uh, these guys are really active. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I thought, you know, how good could they be? They're very good. They're real actors. Uh, and this man uh, was told by his friends not to go into this prison system. They're going to take advantage of you. They're going to make a fool out of you. He's a beautiful person. Uh, you know, there are a lot of indigenous cultures around the world that when somebody in the community does something wrong, they'll take that person and surround him with the community. And uh, they all tell him how much they love him, how valued he is. I remember the time you were nice to my niece. They do everything to love this person up. And that's what I saw happening between Brent and these men in this uh, situation. He was uh, allowing themselves to, to love themselves and in turn love each other. It was a, it was a, a this movie, this work has enhanced my life with the feeling that it gave me. It's just made me a better person. If you can believe that shit, but. <laughs> But it, it's a beautiful movie. I'm so proud to be part of it. And uh, when you see it, you're gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna change. It's gonna shift your consciousness about what prisons are supposed to be doing. It's a sin what, what's happening in our prison system. Everybody should see this movie. Your consciousness is going to shift and expand. I'm just proud, proud to be part of it. Yeah, I mean, facts on top of facts. It, it, it. Yes, please applause for that, yes.
it is a film that sits with you and, and it really does resonate with you. And, you know, talking about rehabilitation and how it changes the trajectory of your life. I want to actually go back to you, Clarence, because you talked a little bit about RTA, um, the re rehabilitation through the arts. Tell me, how did you get introduced into RTA and um, how are you involved with that today? Because you're still involved with that program. Yes, I am. Um, I got introduced into RTA a little differently. Uh, they were given a, they were given a play in the prison, and uh, they closed the yard because of the weather. I was supposed to go to the yard to take care of some business, but I couldn't get there, so we had to go to the chapel to take care of the business. Uh, but while I'm sitting there, I'm, 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 now I gotta watch the rest of this play. I gotta watch the play. I'm watching it, and I'm thinking at first that everybody on stage came from outside. Like these are all actors from outside. So as I watch, as I'm watching, I'm seeing a guy that I I see him in the gym. And I see him in the yard. Hold up, these are prisoners up here with these women and all that. Man, I need to get up here. How do I get up here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was about initially, but you know. Keeping it real right yeah. there, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. You know. yeah, but but once I got into the program, you know, these same women became sisters and aunts and, and teachers and friends, Love you know. The lust went down immediately, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and those, and those relationships are true today. They still my sisters and my friends and confidants and people that I, in times when I need to talk to somebody, I got somebody to talk to, you know. I still what we have right now. And I still work with them right now. In fact, I just got hired on as a, a, teaching, a, a, a teaching assistant, teaching actor, whatever, how you want to give it. I'm going into prisons to help the men understand that listen, we are valuable and we still can contribute. You know, I want y'all to know that I'm gonna shine an example that you listen, I'm out here making it happen with the people, man. It ain't over for us, man. We still This, this film just felt so authentic and genuine to the point where it doesn't feel like it's a dramatization. Um, so Coleman, can you talk about the authenticity of the film? Um, both in its storytelling and the performances. I want to say that it really started with um, our director and our writer, and really, and that was really our north star to make sure that it was as honest as possible. Which is when, at first, I didn't know that my fellow actors were going to be formerly incarcerated folks. I thought, I thought, oh, we're going to cast this. It's going to be a lovely film. We're going to, you know, <laughs> you know. And then he, when when he brought me the idea, I thought, well, that's beautiful. That that's really wonderful. And how how are we going to work this? It's going to be its own thing. You know, it's going to be its own hybrid of different experiences. You know, and also, you know, I know a lot of people weren't familiar with filmmaking as well. But I thought, oh, let's lean into that. That's going to be very cool. Of how do we create this thing together? You know. Um, with everyone's superpowers, you know, so for, for me to be, get a bit more raw and a bit more authentic and lean into that, you know, I think that we didn't have, you know, even, I think it's so authentic because we, we didn't have the sort of trappings of like a larger studio or anything either. We were our own hair and makeup, right? right? Our own continuity right. in a way. I mean, I, I, yeah, 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 we really were. So we were, we were more responsible to each other in the film and the way we're making it and crafting it together. And that starts from our writer and our our writers and director. Um, and I think that, I don't know, I think it was required when you have people who've actually gone through this system, I think it's required to be as honest as possible and you in holding each other accountable. You know, I, there are times you're like, no, that wouldn't happen. This would happen yeah, here. Well, we like, don't talk like that. <laughs> we don't talk like that. He would say this, this way. So we're like, all right, let's correct that. And I think, and I owe that, and I, I really count, and I keep bringing it back to my director as well, being very open. It was always a work in progress. Even on the day, if something didn't feel exactly right, they would hear us, right? And say, oh, let's, can we try that? It, it doesn't feel as honest and authentic. And so I think that that was, um, that was our North Star, truly, to make it as authentic as possible. Sean, this movie was shot in 18 days, which just blows my mind. I mean, that's just a little over two weeks. <laughs> um, what was the 18-day shooting schedule like? Well, you know, w one of the things that's really amazing about the, the the company, really the human beings that put this together, which is led by Greg and Clint, is the true commitment to community and openness. And that starts from jump 
from when you get the script to how they deal with contracts. And everybody that's here on some movie shit needs to look into how they're doing this in a truly democratic way. You know, and so people working on the film, everyone, everyone is everyone. Everyone is equal. And so you come in with that spirit and that their commitment to you. And if you if if someone's putting support and commitment to you, you walk in the room a little fuller or a little more ready to get down. And so I think I say all that to say to deal with some hot ass shit in upstate New York in the decommissioned prison was, you know, you you're armed with all this great spirit and then you're dropped into a, a, a version of a version of hell, and you know, and I think um, somehow they were masterfully able to create this environment where we we rocked it five days a week, and then then walked away. And we're cool together, and they came back in and rocked it, and that energy was uh, it was amazing. That's how you can go, that's one way that you can go deeper into it. You know, we always say it in theater. And, Coma and I come from this group, Campo Santo, uh, uh, in San Francisco. Like, the the closer you can be, the more you can hold each other. The more you can put the candle out there, the darker you can go in, in the work. And that's definitely what we were able to do in there, because it really could be. Man, we, we were in a decommission. We we ate lunch in 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 the cafeteria there, in the mess hall, in wow. the whole shot. You're walking. You see the way they treat people, and they want to dehumanize you. And they want to make you feel in prison. And I just say one word about the word rehabilitation as opposed to punitive rehabilitation through the arts. That means they we are rehabilitate we have a chance for our souls to be saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? Which is very different than what we're dealing with in the rest of the country. I hate to get on the soapbox, but this is very real deal shit that we're dealing with in this country in terms of punitive uh, measures. And I say all that to say is the energy that these folks put into the room in the spirit that was uh, allowed us to rock this 18 days that would seem like, I don't know, like you're gonna do 18 days and knock this thing out and everything, but it actually was a totally lovely, fertile, open, creative environment within this hell that we were in, a version of hell. I mean, kind of piggybacking off of that, the 18 day schedule, because they're, you're working with these you know, incarcerated individuals, is it because you're working with those kind of individuals that there is a different kind of energy as opposed to working with actors that you were able to fit in that 18-day schedule? I, I think it's, and this is m m the thing I love most about the film, the film shows human beings, and we were working with human beings. So we knew what the story was, we knew what the structure was, then we looked at each other as human beings and we got down like that. So it was really was on a spiritual plane mm. that we were able to do it. And I think the idea of you know, incarcerated individuals or not, that's all the story. We all have to do that as performers. We play the story, we play the circumstance, but the human spirit part was really the thing that drove it and hopefully is the thing that's, that comes across in the film. That's what moved me about reading the script and then meeting everyone to get to do it. Paul, the core message of Sing Sing is trust the process. Uh -huh. yeah. But it's also about release. And there's a catharsis in the work that Brent teaches these, these men. Um, share with us how Brent navigates like breath techniques and clear thoughts to help facilitate that release. Well, he's, his uh, presence just kind of uh, demands attention. He's, he's a brilliant man. Uh, and he just demands uh, respect without him demanding it, you know. So you just, uh, I looked at him uh, the same way I looked at the guy that uh, taught me about acting w way back when. Uh, he had, he's got something that I want. He's got a, he had a, a happiness, a peace uh, that I want. I'm doing okay, but I want more, you know. Um, so, he allowed me to uh, bring some of the, my own techniques into it, and he, was, and he shared what he had with me. Uh, I just liked watching him interact with these men and uh, try to just emulate that. But he, he's so deep. He's got so much that he's done in all the years. So uh, this guy is a, he's a saint. He's walking, he's walking among us. <laughs> and uh, I just love him. By the way, uh, 
Sound of Metal was also shot in like 18 days. So Marvel, don't call me. I'm not interested. I like, <laughs> I like doing these, this, this kind of work. Uh, this kind of work is um, very rewarding. I'm kidding. Marvel, if you're out there. <laughs> Marvel, if you're listening. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's just, he's a guy that uh, when you're with him, you just want him to rub up against you because he's very kind. And Marvel, are you here? Are you listening? Uh, but he, he, and he's also married to a woman that they're, they're like uh, one. They're a, they, listen, this guy walks the walk. When some, he's done this several times, somebody gets out of uh, the incarceration and they have no place to go, he takes him into his home several times and lives with them like a brother. Uh, he's the real deal. So. He is the real deal because there, there were scenes where you, you know, go through the meditation with the men and, you know, you're saying breathe in and breathe out. And I found myself actually <sighs> and breathing out and like actually doing the meditation in these scenes. So I, I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah. And can we give a shout out for Sound of Metal? Because that was just absolutely. Oh. But again, again, uh, that type of movie, they, they used actual deaf people to come in, at people that had addiction problems. So again, mixing life with, uh, you know, art with life. Uh, so it's kind of a good mix, you know. Clarence, uh, when did you realize you had a love and passion for performance? Uh, when I got arrested and was in prison and um, got involved with RTA, really. I didn't know. I had no idea. I had no clue. Uh, all my whole life, I, I, I never knew. Getting involved with RTA, um, it gave me the outlet. It gave me the opportunity to do some things, to explore some things, to see what I can do, to see what I like. Never had an opportunity. To, never even knew that I, I didn't get an opportunity to find what I can do or find what I can like because I was so caught up in the life that I was living, the life that was in front of me and the culture that I, I grew up in and, and the environment and everything, all that. Oh, I was so caught up in that that I thought that was the only reality that there was. I didn't think there was any other reality. And um, I, I, I found out that I had a passion for Shakespeare the first time I read it and, and, and I understood it. I understood what he was saying. And I, I, it, was, it was amazing to me that others around me didn't understand, couldn't really. <laughs> I thought everybody understood it. Like, I thought every movie was made in 18 days. I thought that. <laughs> no. Yeah, A lot of I studios thought. would love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, see, I didn't know until I got involved with RTA and I got to taste of that, that, that stage one time. And I got to see the connection between the actors and the audience. And when they really got the emotion that I was trying to, to act out, the, what I was trying to create, the part of the story that I was commissioned with telling, the audience got it. That's when I found that I loved this. Did you love, because your, your scene where you auditioned for Hamlet, it just, it still sticks with me. Did you, did you love Hamlet? Were you first drawn to that play when you got into Shakespeare? Yes, I was. That was it. That's my, that's my piece right there. Hamlet, that little monologue right there is my piece. <laughs> <laughs> that's your dog right there, Hamlet, huh? Go to. <laughs> um, Coleman, you, you started your career in educational theater. Uh, so was inhabiting this role, did it feel like you were reliving moments of your past? And did you feel nostalgic through the process of filmmaking? I don't know if I felt nostalgic, but I knew that what we were creating was something that had such great um, theater roots. And yeah, I, I started my career in the Bay Area with Sean, in many ways, in the early 90s. And we would you know, go around um, Northern California, putting up sets, taking them down, and, and delivering a message to students, to young people. So it did feel, I guess, you know, it's, it's purposeful. I think that, I think, I look at, even look at my own career and what I've been doing, all has its roots in educational theater. Because I, I started out with, you know, purposeful messages, going out on the road to make sure young high school kids knew about AIDS. You know what I mean? Knew about, you know, uh, conflict resolution, you name it. So I think the seeds were already planted. So 33 years later, 
it makes sense to me to be a part of films like this, where I feel like it's impactful that we can actually make a difference in the world. You know, it's, it's all the things that I've learned in the theater, which makes me feel like we can do anything. We, we know we can change someone's mind in this dark space in 90 minutes. We know we can help them think different about the world or, the, or that, that next brother that they see. They won't just, you know, see them as just, you know, a statistic, but they'll see them as human and get to know them and love them and have grace for them. So hopefully that answers your question. Absolutely, I did. Uh, Paul, how much did filming in an actual correctional facility contribute to the experience? Oh, it, it had everything to do with everything. I mean, we're, the first day I got there, it's, it's a, it was a, a prison, uh, prison. The, the barbed wire, you know, all the things that you see. You get in there and uh, you look out this, these gigantic, that, that big room with the big fans going. It was so hot and sweltering, very uncomfortable. Fans are, you can't hear anything because they, they had the fan on so we just can stay uh, semi-dry. And so then when the fans go off, then we did our work. And you look out the window, the windows don't open. Uh, there's nowhere to get any fresh air. And you see the barbed wire and a couple of animals out there. It's, it was, uh, so, and everywhere we went, and even, I'll tell you, this is the best part, too. <laughs> uh, we had, uh, there was some uh, food service that they had. He eventually got fired, but I'll tell you why. I found a hair in my taco. And I uh -oh. thought, oh, I'm really feeling like I'm in prison here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, everything. So I mean, that's just a little. Look at Clarence over there laughing. <laughs> He's like, I feel that. Yeah. No, so everything about it, uh, the smells, the uh, it was sterile, uh, uh, cement floors. My uh, dressing room was a cell, <laughs> you know. With uh, they put a little carpet off me, so I felt comfortable, you know. Uh, it was we were in prison, so I, I can't see doing this. Uh, on a set or anything, uh, it, it would, wouldn't be the same. Um, which I'm sure, you know, in Shawshank Redemption, I don't know where they filmed that, but uh, this was for real. And I, and I have to say, uh, having lunch with these guys every day, eating with them, breaking bread, and more than three, four guys told me, you know, Paul, if I had only met somebody like Brent Buell earlier in my life, I would not have ended up in this place incarcerated. That's how life-changing uh, it is when you find something that, as well for me, acting was everything, but it can change a life. And all these guys that knew it and appreciated it, and you know, that just enhanced everything for me. Uh, Sean, for you, what what did you learn about yourself um, and the craft of acting while you were working with this cast? Wow, that's a deep question. I mean, hopefully, we learn something with every project we do. I mean. You've heard me rant about the, the prison industrial complex. So going in thematically, it meant something just to kind of poke into the wall of that thing. But on a very personal level, you know, Coleman Domingo is my best friend. So to be able to not only perform and be, you know, watch the the it was like a master class for me every single day watching this human being be this human being and be this amazing actor so we knew each other in theaters theaters tinier than this than this stage up here and to see him walk in with the sense I, I wanted I wanted the name of the film to be called divine because I thought it was about us reaching for a sense of the divine within as humans and and I um, you know, Coleman did that every day for all of us. He walked in and gave us all a sense of divinity. And when you have that sense in the room, the spirit, I mean, what, what the potential of what you can do when you're gifted that, it, it's amazing. It goes beyond words on the page or even Pat Scola's amazing cinematography. It goes beyond that. So I feel like I, I had a master class in watching, uh, you know, someone at the top of their form working, but also... It's all, the whole thing is about reflection. The whole film is about reflection. So you spend a lot of time in these intentionally confined spaces and there's nowhere to look, either to creator or within yourself. And I think we all spend a lot of time doing that on the set and, and within the film. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm telling you people, this shit don't happen every day, this, this, this movie Sing Sing. It's a really, it, it's a different, 
it's a different level of experience and it, it a lot of it has to do with my dear friend Coleman's spirit but the way that these people put this movie together it's not typical motherfuckers is not looking for movie deals or likes they're looking to tell stories about our world that we live in and you know what a what an honor to be part of it oh yeah yes Colin, what Sean just said was very beautiful, that you gave a sense of divinity to all of the cast members on the set. How does that make you feel, him saying that just now? I'm loved. <clears throat> that's that's what, I, um, what I believe we can do with uh, whatever skills and gifts that we have is to be examples of love and grace for one another. And if you have an opportunity to do that and to bring that, you bring your whole self. And you inspire everyone to bring their whole selves. And that comes from the people who put this together. That comes from this gentleman right here, who I play a version of, uh, Divine G. Whitfield over here. Divine. It comes from understanding that the story is bigger than you and that you're trying to tell many other people's stories. So you have to give over and, it's, and to know that what my director, George C. Wolfe, would say. He would say, to know that it doesn't have to look like you to be about you. So if you go in with that conviction on everything you do, you really feel like I can leave it all on the floor and leave so much love and grace there, and whatever comes, it's just gonna be whatever comes, but you know that you've done your part. So it feels beautiful. Indeed. Coleman, you also serve as a producer on this project. Um, the role of a producer can vary from project to project. So what specifically were your duties as it relates to this film? Coming in from the ground up, making sure that we were making, they invited me in. The beautiful thing is, I've, I've said this early in my career, like if people want me, they want all of me. You're not gonna get part of me. I have an opinion about everything. <laughs> How we make it. <laughs> Scenes that I'm not in, what's the set gonna look like, location, everything. And these guys wanted it. They want what I thought. How do, who, do, who should we cast? How should we do it? How should we do, build the model? Should we go out in with independent financing? Or, is it, or do we go through a studio system? These were all conversations we hadn't built this together. So producers, it varies with what you do. And I feel like I get in the, in the trenches and make sure that that I, I'm, I'm useful in every single way to make it happen. You, even the, who knows, even if it's the fact that like, you know, if, if my, my roommate is gonna stay, you know, five miles away, I'm like, no, you're staying with me and we sleep in the same room together. <laughs> That's Because you wanna make sure that everyone feels good and everyone feels seen and everyone feels uh, valuable. So, um, yeah. This is a question I'd love for each of you to answer. The rehabilitation through the arts program makes such a significant impact on the men that we see in this film in Sing Sing. So working on this film, going through this journey, how much of an impact did it make on you? Start with Paul and then go down the panel. Just profound, very profound. Um, I don't know what I was, when they, when my management called me to, uh, she was actually begging me to do this. <laughs> and I, I was in, I was in from the moment she mentioned it, but I did not expect what I got uh, when, I, when I got there. Just these beautiful men um, sharing everything they had with me uh, every day and just being in the moment. So uh, just profound, that's all I can say. Yeah, I, I, I think I've said a lot about the system, but what's amazing about the process is watching, again, the human beings. So it's the human beings that, that suffered on the inside, but what's amazing about this project is getting to know the people, because they're, the, they're on the long road, they're on a long journey with it. So each of the folks that you meet that perform in the movie, that perform in the program, they're all still tapped in. This is a movement to make change, and I agree with Racy that our consciousness can, can change, can shift through that. So that's been the most profound part, along with just this beautiful community that we got to share together in them 18 days. But, you know, 
you listen to Devon say, this is the work. This is his life's work. You know, it's not just a bid. Oh, yeah. Um, this movie, this project impacted me in ways that are still resonating right now. Like, I've, I've, I've given my grandkids a better version of a grandfather. I've given my daughter and my son a better version of a father through this, mo through this movement, not just this movie, this movement. Because, you know, the message is so broad that it's going to touch everybody. It's going to touch somebody in everybody's family in this room. Somebody in this room is going to be impacted, just like me. All of y'all going to be impacted when you see it. And it's going to be more impactful to some because of you know somebody like me. Because you got somebody in your family like me. Or you've been around somebody like me. And you hope that they can see life the way I see it now. You know, I hope for them too. I hope they do too. I hope everybody that was in my situation and is still in my situation that I was in before come to the realization that they're valuable, that they have some value, you know, and that's the impact. When you realize that you're valuable, that you can contribute, that it changes the way to not only the world see you, but you, how you see you, and that's the most important thing. And the most impactful thing could be you lifting your own self up to where you want to be. I, I wish, I, as I sit here and I listen to these guys, it's, this is a question that Greg has asked me. You've asked me this twice. And, I, and, I, and again, I don't have an answer. I really don't have an answer because I think that, and I'm starting to think that, I'm like, why don't I have an answer? Because I think I'm, I'm that person that feels like, uh, and maybe I'm not as evolved <laughs> or something, where I feel like, I think like even as an actor, I feel like the moment I'm, I know something, I'm so aware of something, that's the end of the journey. And I feel like I want to keep discovering and being on it. I don't know yet what it's done for me yet. I know that I'm getting little bits here and there. He tells me his mother's going to see the film tonight. I know that's going to affect me in some way. I know there's all these building blocks. By the time we get to July and the film comes out and people, it's resonating with people, I want to see it in work and in process, what it's doing to families and people and communities. I think I'm looking forward to that so I don't know yet. And I feel like maybe that's it. Maybe I'm re resisting it because I feel like that's the end of my journey or something with it. I'm still in process. So I'm answering your question, Greg. I still don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that is the answer. You're in process. Um, before we get to audience questions for the last 15 minutes of this panel, um, I want to toss this last question over to Clarence because you lived this. Uh, wh what do you hope that audiences will take away from this film? There's a lot of core messages and great messages that this film delivers uh, when you watch it, but w what do you hope that will sit and stick with us after we watch it? Well, it takes me back to what theater was really created for. Theater was really, really created to heal. It's really created for individuals to see that they're not the only ones going through whatever they're going through by storytelling. We're going to tell stories, and somewhere along the way you're going to find yourself in this story. But for me, what was the question? Repeat it again. <laughs> what, what, what do you hope the audiences will take right. from what watching What the audience this? will take. Yeah. Right. I hope that they definitely take the fact that we are valuable men and that we can contribute. That's one thing I want them to take. The next thing I want them to take is that they can contribute too by viewing individuals differently. By not, uh, don't blanket every prisoner with the... With the stereotypes of the few or, or whatever you may see on Oz or, or any of these little prison shows that don't depict prison accurately at all. And I have not seen me in a prison show ever. Wow. Wow. They don't show me. They show the worst version of a human being that's been disrespected. Everything, he's the bottom, he's at the bottom. So how do you expect him to act? This is the image that they would like to emulate and say that that's me. That's never who I was in prison, ever. Wow. So yeah, see yeah. me different. That's why you gotta see this film. Absolutely. All right, so we'll go to audience questions. Uh, this is Jenny Mersenne. I've seen several RTA shows at Sing Sing Incredible. Oh, that's awesome. 
Can you talk about the experience of entering and exiting the facility while castmates are still incarcerated? If anybody wants to jump on that question. I don't think anybody can. To go, to go back into prisons, to, to, the best part about it is that you can leave. You, I can leave now. But to go back in is a lot of apprehension because, you know, especially going back in and putting on greens again. You put these, I put these greens on, and I don't know if it's my mind tricking me, but they itch. It seems like they itch now. You know, but the, um, the overall message and the purpose was a lot bigger than my apprehension. This needed to be done, and I needed to be the one to do it. Nobody could have did it but me, so I had to do it. So the message override all apprehension. Awesome, yes. Uh, Kit Stone asks, what is your call to action for audiences that view this film? Oh, I have one. Uh, <laughs> it, it, judgment. Uh, your judgment of who these men are, who these people are. I am against uh, capital punishment. I always have been. What a mistake. Uh, I, uh, I think you, the call to action is think twice. Think twice before you judge these guys. Think twice before you judge anybody that's in a prison. Every place of in, uh, incarceration should have a theater program, every single one around the world, internationally. Because this is, this is uh, people suffering all over the world, needlessly, when they need to be told how valuable they are, how much, how, how much we love you. That's what we need to be doing. The, the absolute opposite of what we are doing. So that's the call to action. This, this program's got to be in every damn prison, period. Yes, I'm surprised it's not, my goodness. Soon. Yeah. Uh, Clarence, yeah. have you seen yourself in any of the characters you've played at RTA? Yes, I have. I see myself in, in also just on stage with characters that I'm not playing. I've seen myself. I've seen myself in when I played Booster in Jitney. August Wilson's play Jitney. I see myself at various points of the play. I was Booster, and at other points of the play, I was Booster's father. I seen that in me. You know, so just being a part of the arts help. This is how just being on set and being in the present or even being in the audience, just being in the room is, is a growing and learning experience any time the arts are involved. I don't care if it's visual arts or whatever art, instruments, you want to sing, however, paint, whatever. Whenever art is introduced into the room, there's growth and development going on. And that question was by Nicholas Martin, by the way. Thank you. Oh, yeah, please applause for that. <laughs> uh, Kevin Lee, keeping with the themes of the film and its message, how do you keep yourself grounded and how do you remind yourself to be hopeful and optimistic every day? Sean, you want to take that one? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, I mean, for me, just as I mean, Prayer, you know, is 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 an important thing. I know it's not cool to talk about religion in the art sometimes, but I'm trying to get through the day, you know. And God is love, and like Coleman was saying, if we can just love more, so try to remind ourselves about that. That, you know. Yes, absolutely. Right. It's okay to applause that, y'all. That, that, that's real. That is real. India Wilmot asks, "I'm a theater artist, and I I'm a theater artist, and I appreciate you bringing our Paul for our I cannot talk <laughs> our powerful art form to film in this way. Do you think this is how we keep theater alive?" I think theater is just a, a great useful tool to to tell stories in any any way. I think that I think that I think the theater is learning to find its way through this moment of high technology and it's always being challenged, especially the not-for-profit not theater. So I feel like the more that we can find ways of hybrids, of different ways of storytelling, is gonna benefit all of us. I think, I mean, at the end of the day, once we get people into the theaters, they realize, they always remember why they love the theater. <laughs> it's just getting you there, <laughs> you know? So yeah. 
Rachel Cook, it seems that studios are pulling back on movies with a social message. What would you tell execs on why these projects are important and profitable? I think the truth. Audience <laughs> profitable? I'm sitting up here with one one movie that truly had a social message, message this season. So I th I'm I'm not mm. sure if I agree with that. To be honest, mm. I think it takes the I think it takes heartful, mindful, thoughtful producers, and it takes a lot probably a little bit more backbone and pushing through the system to say that these stories matter. And I think it's all dependent on how we finance it, how we develop it, you know, how how we get it done. I, I, so I think it's. You know, I, I never think that it relies on the studios to do anything in that way. I think it's more about the people demanding that they want to tell these stories and figure out how to get it done. And that's how this has gotten done. You know, I feel like it, it takes an independent spirit. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not about, I guess, as we mentioned, Marvel. It's not going to, yeah, it's not, it's not going to be as huge as Marvel in that way. But we believe it's purposeful. So you find your inroad and you find your way and your path with work like this. And shout out to A24 for onboarding like great independent oh, projects. Uh, Sharon Moore, it doesn't have to look like you to be about you. She has it in quotes. With culture wars going on, how can people who are resistant to stories that don't look like them be more inclusive? That's a good question. Listen, I think th this is it. I'll start by this. I'm going I'm to break up the rum a little bit, okay? <laughs> we were in, um, uh, a group of actors were in uh, Alaska uh, see, uh, doing a play in Alaska. And we all went to go see a movie. We all had one night to go see a movie. And we all went, oh, you know, Hustle and Flow's playing. Let's all go see that. So a group of actors, black, white, gay, straight, and everything, we all go to the movie theater. Our friend Margot Hall says something. So we go, we go to the movie. Everybody had a good time. Terrence Howard, Taraj B. Henson. It was wild. We're walking down the street. And this guy, Michael, white guy, Broadway guy, you know, very conservative, says, wow, that's very interesting. I would have never seen that film. We're like, what? Really? Why? And he said, well, I just don't think it's marketed towards me. And then my friend Margot said, well, I'll go see Cold Mountain. And she's a black woman from Detroit. <laughs> and she's, she said, I'll go see Cold Mountain. And, and we, then we start to have this great conversation about the fact that, like, you know, probably more people of color and people outside of you know, certain systems are used to seeing themselves in other movies. We've had to. Now it's your turn. No, 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 no but, it, but it's true. But to understand that, yeah, it, it's true. It's like, no, go see that story. You may not think it has anything to do with you, but I'm sure it does, actually. Just because it's not marketed towards you, it doesn't look like you, that makes no sense to me. Like, especially with the, the palette of movies I watch. I watch Zone of Interest and Anatomy of a Fall. Right. Ain't nobody in there that looks like me. Right. But I'm interested in those stories, right. Yes. right? So that means that people have got to get out of their comfort zones and get interested in other stories that don't look like you. So do it. That's right. Do it. That's right, do it. <laughs> Love to see it. Uh, Alec, a I'm sorry, Abe Mitchell. As actors of stage and screen, did you have to consider what a theatrical performance, in quotes, would look like on screen, and how did you perfect the size of your performances? Yes. I thought so, especially like when we're performing, like when we're performing on stage, like the opening monologue. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that that was actually, because it's to camera, and you didn't want to play to the mezzanine. You know, so right, say right. there's something you had to fi sort of figure out. In fact, that's what you talked about. Talk to, yeah, we talked about that. That's how I, and I, I had explained that to somebody else in the, another interview that I had gotten that from you. That in theater, I, I had learned to play to this guy in the last seat, way over there. They got to understand me very clearly. They got to hear. I got to enunciate every word so that he can hear it. You know, it had to be big. And then we got in the movie thing, and you brought that thing down to that eight-inch screen. And explained to me that this is different. <laughs> yeah. So. I, was, I was like, you know, we were talking about it, like, you know, just let the camera, let, it's just you to the camera. It's just, right, it's, right, just it's more right. intimate and it's okay. There's a lot more intimacy. And I think that's how we got to um, perfect the size of the performance. Perfect the size of the performance because we didn't have to go as big and or even as loud because you remember we was by the window doing the window scene. I almost whispered that thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, it's funny, because there's a question that a lot of people ask as well, especially for people who go between theater and film and television, wondering if it's very different. And it's just about how do you dial it up or back. And I think he just ex ex explained it clearly. Yeah, you're trying to communicate out to the back of the house, but this you're just trying to communicate that story and do the same work, but intimately. Right. You know? Zachary Berger asks, what can we do to make Hollywood and our society recognize exceptional performances by LGBTQ actors more routinely? I think stop calling them LBG LGBTQ actors. Stop calling them that. I spoke about this with um, a fellow actor on the Hollywood Roundtable, where it's, you know, I understand representation is very important for, for the com marginalized communities, yes. But when you're constantly, always, suddenly being seen, it, in a way that you don't even see yourself, of just like, oh, we're, we're attaching these letters to you before just saying you're an actor, like Danny Day-Lewis or wh whoever else who can just be an actor. They don't say white actor or Irish actor or Scottish actor, but you're always, you have something in front of you. And if you're, you're like, you know, will that, because it hasn't for me, which I've been very conscious of, limited my experience in my industry, but could it if that moniker is always placed before me with every single thing that I do? Even if it's like that, I'm not coming. Everything I'm, I'm not coming at Mr. the Color Purple from an LGBTQIA right. perspective. I'm an actor, investigating a character in a whole human being. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's a tricky question. I think. I think, yeah. and I understand that people want because people are hungry. We're hungry for representation. Saying that's mine. I, we belong there. We're in these spaces now. So I think that's where that comes from. And I think, but I think that like like my brother over here said. I think it also does put, it could possibly put limits sometimes or a different framework around it. You know what I mean? Right, right. So it's complicated. It is complicated because then sometimes those communities are important because that's a way for us to they're foster always, and they're find always each other. They're always important, not sometimes. They're always important always, to, yeah. to, so we can find and see ourselves. Exactly. Because we've, it's been a long time not seeing ourselves. Exactly. But I think people should be represented by the way they, like we're saying, how they represent themselves, right. the what 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 um, tags right. they put on themselves, right. you know. Indeed, indeed. All right, time for one more question, and that is, Ethan Simi. What is the one key element in creating such a vulnerable and inclusive onset energy that comes across on screen? Honesty. Hmm. Be honest about the work. Be honest about who you are. We show up every day in our skin, and. Um, um, I don't have I don't have time to fake for nobody. I don't got time to do it. I'm 58 now. I ain't got time to play no games with y'all. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> ain't got time for that. <laughs> yeah. So I think honesty. Just be just show up honestly, man. Honestly, you and be willing to honestly give. To be if you commit to this thing right here, and be honest about it, and, and give all the because we everybody here giving 120. Everybody every day. Because that's just how we build. On TA, we got a competitive, a, a, a competitive thing going on where, you know, it's 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 not competitive in a, a negative way. We want to see each and our, each and one every one of our brothers do better. We, every one of us uplifts every other one of us. So when we get on set, we got a we got a thing where we gonna you got to get this in one take, bro. Everybody here, we getting our thing in one take, man. If you get if you take two takes, man. <laughs> that's why it was in 18 days. Goodness gracious. <laughs> One take. Um, thank you, Paul, Sean, Clarence, Coleman, for this incredible panel. Uh, this film is a masterpiece. And please, everyone, go see this. You have the opportunity here at South By to go to more than one screening. If you missed the first one, you can go to the second one. Um, the film also will be coming out in theaters. I, again, I laughed. I cried. I was mad. It was an emotional roller coaster and it's the kind of film where you know after you watch it you're gonna have a conversation with friends family members and just talk about it for days and days on end um, so thank you for taking the time to speak with all of us about this incredible piece of work thank you. thanks for having us <laughs>